So it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I welcome the faculty and students and high school students that I had the pleasure of having uh, pizza with. They had pizza. I'm going to eat afterwards. I know that for a couple of dollars, you could have watched the movie instead called Dopamine. came out a few years ago apparently won a prize at the Sundance Film, Film Festival. I take objection to the byline here, which says love, real or just a chemical reaction, because I'm in a biochemistry department and I don't like the idea of belittling chemistry. Uh, I think chemistry is very, pretty important. This is tyrosine, one of the 20 building blocks of proteins. And it's the substrate that gives rise to dopamine. Tyrosine is modified by an enzyme we're going to talk about tonight called tyrosine hydroxylase, which puts that hydroxyl group onto the benzene ring of tyrosine. It's still, this molecule is now called L-DOPA, and you'll hear more about L-DOPA in a minute. The carboxyl group off on the right is removed in the next step, and that gives rise to dopamine. So what you see there is now dopamine. And in the periphery, as well as in the central nervous system, another reaction, another hydroxylation occurs, and now it's norepinephrine, also called noradrenaline. When you're nervous, like I am, your adrenaline levels are high. Julius Axelrod, won the Nobel Prize uh, quite a while ago now for elucidating and characterizing this biosynthetic pathway. Ulf von Euler, von Euler sorry, uh, won the Nobel Prize for discovering that norepinephrine is indeed a neurotransmitter. It's also made in your adrenal gland where it can be released and as, acts as a hormone, but von Euler discovered that norepinephrine is also a neurotransmitter released from nerves and involved in, in signaling from one nerve to another. And Arvid Carlson was the first to realize that dopamine is not just a precursor for norepinephrine, but it's also a neurotransmitter in its own right. And that was in the early 60s. My talk tonight is divided into four sections. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on dopamine as a neurotransmitter. I'm then going to tell you about mice that can't make any dopamine. I'm going to follow that with a set of experiments where we take those mice and then restore dopamine to specific subsets of neurons. And finally, I'm going to tell you a story about our attempts to change the firing properties of dopamine neurons themselves. So what you see in this figure of a, of a rodent brain is in dark, staining here, a region of the brain called the striatum. And it receives excitatory inputs from the cortex. This input would be related to sensory information as well as motor information. And there's sort of a topographical map, so certain parts of the cortex project to one part of the striatum, other parts of the cortex project to another part of the striatum. And the dopamine neurons that we're going to talk about today live back here in the hindbrain, and they send their axonal processes into the striatum. And we're going to talk about two different populations. Those that innervate the ventral part of the striatum come from a region called the ventral tegmental area, 
and those that innervate the dorsal part come from a region called the substantia nigra. There are, in fact, other dopaminergic systems, which I've just put here as in green. We're not going to talk about those tonight. But just keep in mind that dopamine is widely used as a neurotransmitter in the rodent brain. It's also in flies. It's also in worms. It's been around as a neurotransmitter for a long time. The entire mouse brain has several hundred million neurons, and there are only about 10,000 here. So these are minor players in terms of their number, but you're going to see in the next 50 minutes that these neurons are incredibly important. Here's the circuit shown in a, more of a stick diagram. The neurons that were in that darkly stained area in here are called medium spiny neurons. They're shown here in pink. And they receive excitatory input, as I mentioned, from the cortex. So these ne blue neurons are going to excite these pink neurons. And the dopamine neurons, shown here in red, are going to modulate the signaling. I'm going to show you how that works in a little bit. But first I want to show you the neurons themselves. We're going to talk about the synapse right here, where all these three, two transmitters, glutamate, another amino acid, and dopamine, which is derived from an amino acid, talk to this pink neuron. So all of this, these synapses we're going to talk about are in the striatum, and the neurons that live there, 90% of them anyway, are so-called medium spiny neurons. And they look kind of like spiders. And so these are their processes that receive information from other neurons. And if you look closely, you can see that there are little spikes sticking off of these processes. And those are called spines. And these are called medium spiny neurons because they have a lot of spines. And that's because they're receiving a lot of excitatory input coming from the cortex. The neurons in the cortex look different. They're called pyramidal cells. You can kind of tell that their cell bodies look like little pyramids. These would be their dendrites, and they also have spines that you can't see so clearly, and their ax axons come down here. The dopamine neurons aren't stained by the same stain that stains these neurons, but was recently shown, just a, a year ago, uh, by using a virus that expresses a fluorescent protein to label single dopamine neurons. And the point is that here's the cell body of a dopamine neuron back in the midbrain, and those would be its dendrites, they're fine. And the, this big ball of blue and red is the axonal projection of a dopamine neuron. So it's huge. One neuron, so here's the striatum shown here, one neuron fills about 10% of the entire striatum. So if a dopamine neuron is an oak tree, and these are all the branches and twigs on the, on the top of the oak tree, then what you saw before for a cortical neuron would look like a little sapling with just a few branches. So these are incredible neurons that probably make contacts with tens of thousands of those medium spiny neurons. So let's look at a little closer detail at the input, the excitatory input from the glutamate producing neurons in the cortex that are going to impinge on the spine of a medium spiny neuron in the striatum. Glutamate is a fast excitatory uh, transmitter. When this neuron becomes excited, some of these vesicles that contain glutamate fuse with the membrane, releasing glutamate into the synaptic space. And the glutamate then interacts with these receptors, called glutamate receptors, on the postsynaptic membrane on, of this in the spine. As Bill Catterall told you a couple weeks ago, these receptors are ion channels. They let sodium and perhaps calcium into the cell depolarizes this cell, and if there's enough signaling, this cell will also depolarize and send a signal on to the next neuron in the pathway. Okay. So here's our excitatory input onto the spine, and now we're looking at one of the hundreds of thousands termini of dopamine neurons 
And dopamine, like glutamate, is packaged into its synaptic vesicles. And when this neuron is excited, dopamine will be released into the synaptic space. And it's going to act on these red receptors. And they're a little different than the ion receptors, ion channels you, we talked about it before. These receptors set off signaling cascades within the cell, leading initially to protein modifications that may change the efficacy with which the synaptic transmission is propagated. Or in some cases, they may decrease the efficacy depending on the type of receptor. So dopamine, as I told you, is made from tyrosine and there's a synthetic pathway. There are a few drugs that have been studied. I'm just going to indicate a, a few of them here. We may come back to talk about them a little bit later. And these drugs have been used to kind of explore how the dopamine system works. The first one is called alpha-methyltyrosine, and it inhibits the enzyme that converts tyrosine to L-DOPA. So if you want to make a mouse that can't make as much dopamine, you can treat it with this drug. Amphetamine is a drug that releases dopamine from the synaptic vesicles, and the dopamine can get out into the synaptic space and interact with the dopamine receptors. And so in that sense, it kind of mimics dopamine. But it is sort of super special because it can release a lot of dopamine, so it'd be like a very robust dopamine signal. Cocaine is, acts in a slightly similar way. Cocaine acts on a receptor that recycles dopamine. A lot of neurotransmitters, after they're released in the synapse, are recycled back into the cell that makes it so that it can be used a second time. And the, the transporter that transports dopamine back into the cell is blocked by cocaine, and hence the level of dopamine out in the synapse rises because it can't be cleared as rapidly. And finally, pharmaceutical companies have made a whole series of drugs that bind directly to the receptors and can either activate them or inhibit them. So what is the function of dopamine? Probably most of you know that dopamine is involved in Parkinson's disease. And in Parkinson's disease, those neurons that I showed you that make dopamine are gradually dying. And when about 70% of the neurons have died, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease first begin to appear. But Parkinson's disease does in fact affect a certain subpopulation of dopamine neurons, but it turns out that a number of other neurons are also affected, and their, their locations are shown on, on this map. As you know, Parkinson's disease is characterized as a movement disorder, an inability to initiate movement, inability to control movement, and usually a, uh, uh, a, a shakiness. Those of you who have uh, seen Muhammad Ali on television uh, or um, Michael J. Fox kind of know that even young people, middle-aged people, can develop Parkinson's disease. But generally, Parkinson's is associated with old age, usually age 60, 70 or so. Shortly after dopamine was discovered as a neurotransmitter, L-DOPA was discovered to actually improve the health and behavior of people with Parkinson's disease. Even though only 30% of the neurons are left, if you give those neurons L-DOPA, they can then convert that into dopamine, and that helps restore normal dopamine signaling. Some of you may have seen the movie by Oliver Sacks that came out quite a while ago now called Awakening. And basically Oliver is describing people who had been given L-DOPA for the very first time. And they'd been completely hypoactive, unable to move, given L-DOPA within minutes. They were up and walking around. It was fairly remarkable. Another function of dopamine is in reward or pleasure. And one of the early experiments that kind of suggested that uh, was initiated by Olds and his collaborators in the early 60s. And basically, they were trying to explore the function of different parts of the brain. 
and their approach was to take an electrode and stick it into the brain in different places and then turn up the current a little bit and see if anything happened. And they discovered that if they put the electrode in one particular place in the lateral hypothalamus, that the uh, rats, in this case, would uh, press a lever that was connected to this electrode to stimulate themselves. So it was called a self-stimulation paradigm. At the time, they didn't know what they were stimulating. They just knew where in the brain they could stimulate and an animal would press, 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 press this lever to get more and more stimulation. And they suggested that there was a pleasure center in that place where the electrode was and that the rats liked the effect of that stimulation. In fact, if you gave the animals the choice of either pressing the lever or eating food, they would press the lever and actually lose body weight because they didn't eat adequately. So this was was fine, except they didn't really have a clue at the neurochemical level what was going on. However, they did a number of other experiments, and they basically showed that using that drug alpha-methyltyrosine that inhibits dopamine synthesis would suppress the ability of the rat or the willingness of the rat to lever press for the electrical stimulation. So that implicated dopamine in the response. And furthermore, drugs that blocked the dopamine receptors had the same effect. And so these two pieces of information suggested to Olds and his collaborators and the, his students that followed on that maybe dopamine was somehow involved with this pleasure. Subsequent experiments that I'm not going to illustrate had rats self-administer the other excitatory uh, drugs, amphetamine or cocaine, and rats would also press a lever to get an infusion of cocaine or amphetamine, which released dopamine. So those two pieces of information sort of cemented the idea that dopamine might be involved in pleasure. So we've talked about dopamine in terms of movement, in terms of pleasure. It was actually uh, Urban Ungerstedt and the Karolinska Institute in Sweden who used this drug that was, had recently been, had been discovered just about that time called 6-hydroxydopamine. It has yet another hydroxyl group on the benzene ring, and it turns out to be a toxin. It's specifically taken up by dopamine neurons, and it kills them. And when Ungerstedt injected this drug into the striatum of rats, he observed bilateral, complete denervation of the dopamine system that comes from the substantia nigra, and it produced severe, long-lasting adipsia, they don't drink water, aphagia, they don't eat food, and hypoactivity, they had difficulties initiating activity, and they lost exploratory behavior and all curiosity. You're gonna see a movie of that re resembles this phenotype in just a few minutes. So that's the transition then from the background to our experiments. So we're, we use mouse genetics to switching from rats to mice. And what we wanted to do was to inactivate the gene necessary for making dopamine. And so we chose to inactivate the tyrosine hydroxylase gene that converts dopamine to L-DOPA. The mouse has about 30,000 genes, just like humans. And many of the genes are the same as mice and humans, almost all of them are. And this is a representation of the tyrosine hydroxylase gene. The way we're gonna modify this tyrosine hydroxylase gene is to use what we call gene targeting and we do that in embryonic stem cells. Embryonic stem cells can be used to rederive a mouse. And so the goal of these experiments is to take these embryonic stem cells, genetically manipulate them the way we want to, and then make a mouse out of those stem cells. It's a fairly remarkable process. We start by taking a little piece of the tyrosine hydroxylase gene, and we insert into it another gene which replaces a critical part of the endogenous tyrosine hydroxylase gene. 
And then by a process called homologous recombination, this targeting construct searches the three billion base pairs that make up the mouse genome and searches for the tyrosine hydroxylase gene. And when it does so, it replaces the normal TH gene with this red neo gene. And in the process, it kills the tyrosine hydroxylase gene. Those of you who are paying attention and haven't fallen asleep yet will realize that if you knock out tyrosine hydroxylase, you can't make L-dopa, you can't make dopamine, and you also can't make norepinephrine. And this creates a problem because mice that can't make norepinephrine die as embryos. And we want to study the function of dopamine in the adult mouse. So we did another trick, a genetic trick, that I'm not going to show you, just take my word for it, that we could restore tyrosine hydroxylase to the neurons that normally make norepinephrine, leaving those substantia nigra and ventral tegmental neurons deficient in tyrosine hydroxylase, and we call those mice dopamine deficient mice. They have normal norepinephrine synthesis. Quin Young Zhao made those mice in 1995, and Mark Stipka has studied them afterwards, and many of the students in my lab have been studying them ever since. So these mice that can't, <coughs> excuse me, can't make tyrosine hydroxylase or in dopamine neurons, they have a very short lifespan. Here's a survival curve, 100% survival of normal mice. And as you can see, by about two, four weeks of age, all the mice that can't make dopamine have died. If you were to look at the growth of these mice, the growth of a normal mouse is shown here. The growth of these mice is normal at first. When they're about 10 days old, they're the runts of the litter, and then their weight actually declines, and most of them die. If, however, you give these mice L-DOPA, then every day, then their growth resumes, and it turns out you can keep them alive, just like you could keep a Parkinson's patient alive giving them L-DOPA every day. Turns out that the dopamine neurons themselves are normal, even though they can't make dopamine, and the neurons that they talk to also develop normally. As I just said, if we, if we don't treat them with L-DOPA, they all die. These mice, we believe they die because they don't eat. We believe they're not motivated to eat, and I'll show you that in a video in a minute. They can eat if you put food in their mouth. They can swallow it. And at certain times of the day, as you'll see, they eat a little bit. But they don't eat enough to keep themselves alive. Furthermore, they don't respond to stimuli that would normally elicit feeding. For example, if you make an animal with low blood glucose, like you might feel in the late afternoon, a normal animal will go get a candy bar or go with food. A dopamine deficient mouse made hypoglycemic doesn't do that. It, so as I already showed you, these mice can be rescued by treating them daily with L-DOPA. They can also be rescued by treating them with viruses that restore tyrosine hydroxylase to specific brain regions. And I'll show you that in the third part of my talk. So what you see here is the activity of a mouse during uh, a typical two-day period. Normally, they'd be given L-DOPA every day, but here we're just going to give it once, and we're going to wait 48 hours without giving it a second time. A normal mouse, we're going to measure this. These mice are in a cage that has monitors that, that are actually uh, beams of light. When the mouse breaks the beam, we can record that, and we can figure out how far they've actually moved. And a normal mouse in the, such a cage is active during the night, we're indicated by the dark bar, relatively inactive, sleeping during the day. And this would be the activity of a normal mouse. A dopamine deficient mouse during the day is very inactive. We inject it with L-DOPA, and you can see it becomes very hyperactive, about 20 times more active than a normal mouse. And then over the next 10 hours or so, it becomes hypoactive again. Normally at 24 hours, it would get another injection, but if you don't, you see this little peak of activity, which doesn't look like much there, but if you blow it up, 
it's a fairly significant peak of activity. And during this time, the mice can climb around on the cage top. They can do a lot of things that normal mice do, but they don't eat very much. During this period, when they have L-DOPA on board and can make dopamine, they eat a lot. And during this period, when they still move a little bit, they eat very little. So this is a movie that's made by Siobhan Robinson when she was a graduate student in the lab. And here's one of these dopamine deficient mice. And the point here is it's got good balance, hangs onto her finger. In fact, she actually has to push it off the end of her finger. If you had a wild mouse, it would have jumped out of her hand in milliseconds. So now she's going to put two of these mice together in a big open space. And you can see they would be pretty unexciting pets. They don't <laughs> interact with each other at all. And these are two wild type mice. And they're going to come along and they'll nudge the, the dopamine deficient mice, but still not very much happens. I think the next scene is going to be feeding behavior. So these are still the dopamine deficient mouse, mice. And Siobhan's going to put little pieces of their favorite food right in front of their nose. They move a little bit. They probably know it's there, but they're not, they're not going <laughs> to eat it. So these mice haven't eaten for 24 hours. They've lost 10% of their body weight during that period of time. They're very hungry, but they're not hungry enough or not motivated enough to eat. So what you just saw there was she's going to inject them with L-DOPA and put them back in the cage. And now you can see they can move around. This is just early. Uh, 45 minutes later, they'd be charging around this cage 20 times the speed you see here. That's about what a wild type mouse moves. There's another one. So that one up, this one was injected with L-DOPA. The other one was not. She's now going to try to feed the two mice. The one that was injected with L-DOPA is very hungry, and she goes right after the food. And the dopamine deficient mouse down here could care less. So I would describe these mice as apathetic. They basically aren't interested in their food. They're not, it, normal mice would build a nest. These mice would never bother to build a nest. They're very asocial, uninter, uninteractive mice. It kind of looks like apathy. So how do we understand apathy or lack of motivation or lack of goal-directed behavior knowing what we know already about the circuitry? So let's come back to our cartoon of the mouse brain. Remember the cortex, all the sensory information the sight and smell of food, for example, and the dopamine signaling onto those medium spiny neurons that live here in the striatum. So here's the input from the cortex, the sensory information. Here's the output from the medium spiny neurons in pink, and here's the dopamine signal. What dopamine does is to strengthen strong cortical excitatory inputs and it weakens or suppresses weak ones. So it actually highlights those inputs that are actually the most important at the time. So for example, if a mouse hasn't eaten, then the sight and smell of food is pretty important. And maybe the tick that's kind of itching its leg isn't so important, or the sound of birds singing in the tree isn't very important. But the sight and smell of food is very important. And so that signal would be strengthened and the others would be weakened by the action of dopamine. And as a consequence, if you don't have any dopamine, all sensory inputs are equal. And it appears as though the mouse responds with apathy, doesn't know what to do. And so it just doesn't respond at all. And you have this sort of apathetic, uh, amotivated kind of phenotype. So remember that I told you that some people think that dopamine is involved in reward. People and rodents like sugar. They like sweets. 
And so Claire Cannon, when she was a postdoc in the lab, set up a very simple experiment. She had a cage which had two liquid dispensers. One has water in it, and the other has sugar water, sucrose. She called this a lickometer cage because this, there are little electrodes attached to the drinking spouts, and she could record every lick that the mouse made at the, either of these uh, spouts. There's Claire. And what she observed was that a normal mouse has many what we call bouts of licking. A bout is a, just a group of licks. In this case, several hundred licks at one of these spouts. And the solid circles are licks at the sucrose dispensing spout. The open circles are the licks at the water dispensing spout. And it's perfectly obvious that normal mice have lots of bouts, and they almost all of them are at the sucrose dispenser. Dopamine deficient mice also like sucrose. All of their bouts are at the sucrose dispenser, but they have very few. But interestingly, when they do go to the sucrose dispenser, their bouts are bigger. And if one does the statistics, you can show that they actually lick uh, faster, the bout length is longer, the number of licks per bout is greater but the number of bouts is 20-fold lower. And that's why they starve to death. They don't initiate licking behavior, but when they do, their motor activity of actually licking and consuming the sucrose is actually super normal. So we say that they're not motivated to initiate feeding. OK, we're starting then part three. So now we have these dopamine deficient mice, and now what we want to do is try to restore dopamine to particular parts of the brain. These are experiments done by Tom Nasco, shown here after a party. Uh, I think it was my retirement party. <laughs> Not retirement, my 65th birthday party. I haven't retired yet. So this is another dopamine deficient mouse. It's a little bit different. Remember the last one, we put this neogene, we actually replaced part of the the endogenous tyrosine hydroxylase gene. In this case, we put the neogene in this space between some of the critical parts that are called exons. And in this space, the neogene disrupts the expression of tyrosine hydroxylase. But interestingly, we can use an enzyme called Cre recombinase that recognizes these red bars and will delete the DNA between the two red bars. And so the consequence is to remove the neogene, remove the break that prevents the tyrosine hydroxylase gene from being expressed, and now you have a normal Th gene. And so this is a pretty clever strategy. And so what Tom is going to do then is take a virus. It's called canine adenovirus. It's a dog virus. And it's, this Cre recombinase has been engineered into that virus. Going to inject the virus into the dorsal part of the striatum. And the virus has the interesting property of being able to be retrogradely transported back to the cell body, find the Th gene, remove the neogene, and turn Th back on. So we're going to start with a mouse that doesn't have Th expression anywhere, and it's going to get turned on in those neurons that project to the site where the virus was injected. So here's where the virus was injected. We're now going to take a section through the brain of the mouse where the substantia nigra and ventral tegmental area are. And this is what you'd see in a wild-type mouse, a normal mouse. You would see green cells, which are markers of the cells that express tyrosine hydroxylase and make dopamine here and here and over here. He injected up here. You can see a lot of green cells in the substantia nigra, but this ventral tegmental area in the middle, which has lots in the wild-type, just has a few so the experiment worked. He was successfully able to restore tyrosine hydroxylase to some of the neurons that project to the site of injection. If you now look back at the site of injection, which is in the dorsal striatum, this is where the virus was injected within that yellow circle. But you can see that it's not just the yellow circle that's turned green, which is green is, remember, tyrosine hydroxylase. It's the whole dorsal striatum. And remember that these dopamine neurons are like oak trees. 
So the virus probably went into one little branch that happened to be here, went back to the cell body, recombination, and then TH came back and filled all the branches, and hence filled all the dorsal striatum. So these mice then had been getting L-DOPA every day for their life, were injected with virus, continued to get L-DOPA for a few days to allow the virus to do its thing, and then they discontinued L-DOPA. If you did this with a virus that didn't carry recombinase, the mice would lose body weight and die. But you can see here, instead, the mice continually gain weight and, in fact, even surpass that of their control littermates. Before, they were hypoactive. Here, we're putting them in an activity. And so what you can see is the animals that have been rescued are actually more active than the control animals. So Tom has restored their ability to eat and their ability to locomote, and they do so in a circadian manner, uh, just like wild-type animals, by inject restoring dopamine just in the dorsal striatum. Okay, now you may think what we want to talk about now is the other part of my title, learning and salience. So you may think that mice are pretty dumb. There's a wonderful video that's on uh, the YouTube, which I'm going to try to show you. Some of you probably know what a uh, dog agility trial is, where you have dogs that are trained to do various kinds of maneuvers that look a lot like this. You're going to have to watch this in, in triple time, I guess. But this mouse is called the world's smartest mouse. Its, its name is Brainstorm and you'll see that it can do amazing things. So this is, this is Brainstorm. I'm told it took about two weeks to train this mouse. A little hesitant, but he seems to know exactly what to do. I'd like to see you train your pet cat to do this. <laughs> it's hard enough with a dog. I'm told to use clicker training to train this mouse. is the only place he gets a little guidance is to go around this cactus before climbing, going across the tightrope. <laughs> okay, you get the idea, pretty smart mouse. So what you saw there was the product after training. What we're interested in is the role of dopamine in actually learning various kinds of tasks. And the, our task compared to what you just saw, are very simple, but they're easier to score. One very simple task is to have a long trough, about a yard long. You place the animal in one end of the trough, it has water in it, and there's a visible platform at the other end. A normal mouse learns very quickly to swim towards the visible platform where it can get out and be dried off. Another task, which I'm going to show you, is called a Morris water maze. It's a big tub, about a yard in diameter, and the platform isn't visible. It's underneath milky water. There's some various markers around the tub that the mouse can use to navigate to try to find this platform. First, it finds it just by chance, but then it should remember, oh yeah, it was kind of over here halfway between the cross and the cylinder and a little bit in from the edge. And so you'll see that a mouse can actually learn that pretty easily. Here's another water maze where it's called, a, the platform is visible, but you can't see the platform at the choice point. You have to come up here, take a left, and only after you've committed to go to the left can you see the platform. Dopamine deficient mice can learn this task. They won't do it on their own, but if you train them 
and every day you put them in the water, they just swim around and never go to the platform, and then you inject them on a test day with L-DOPA, restoring dopamine, then they swim directly to the platform. So they learned where it was, but they won't demonstrate what they've learned without dopamine. But they can't even learn these other two tasks. I'll show you that in a minute. Here's some other tasks that people do called novel object recognition. Day one, you present the mouse with a triangle and a cross. And then on day two, and mice like novel objects, so they go in and explore both of these. And then the next day, you change one of them. And a normal mouse will explore the new object. It says, well, I've already seen the triangle. Let's go check out the cylinder. It looks new. And so you can score that. Another one is called place preference. Just imagine you're looking down on a box that has three chambers, and the two side chambers are as different as possible, different texture, different color, whatever. And you can then place the mouse in one side of this apparatus, coop it up there so it can't go anywhere else, and then expose it to a drug or to food or to electric shock or whatever. If the mouse had a good experience, the next day when you test it, it'll spend time there. If it had a bad experience, it'll avoid that side and go to the other. And here's a, a third behavior that's commonly used. It's called two-way active avoidance. The animal has to learn that there's going to be a tone that comes on, and it's got five seconds before it's going to get a shock. Wherever it is, if it goes to the other side, it won't get the shock. So you learn, listen to the tone, oh, i got to move. And you zip over to the other side. So dopamine deficient mice can learn price preference for drugs like morphine and cocaine. They can't learn these other things. Here's a mouse in a Morris water maze. The first mouse that you're going to see is going to hunt around in this water maze looking for the hidden platform. I can tell you that it's up here at about 12 o'clock. But this mouse never even happens to cross that region and so doesn't find it. And it's given 90 seconds to try to find the platform. If it doesn't find it, find it, the experimenter puts the mouse on the platform and lets them kind of stay there for a few seconds, and get their bearings, and then test them the next day. So here's after several days of training, that mouse zipped right to the platform and knew exactly where it was. Okay? So if you want to plot the data, you can do it this way. The escape latency, the time it takes for a mouse to get to the platform. And this is training day with several trials per day. A control animal, can, just like you just saw, can, after lots of training, can find the platform in 10 seconds or so. A dopamine deficient mouse will just float around and it'll swim, um, but it'll never find the platform. So more recently, we've begun to do more sophisticated uh, injections. So instead of replacing dopamine in the entire dorsal striatum shown here in green, we're going to do just the dorsal lateral part of the striatum to ask what can a mouse do with dopamine only in one restricted part of the striatum. Remember that there's some kind of topographical uh, information flow, certain parts of the cortex project here, other parts project here, other parts project there. And so these are experiments done by Martin Darvis, who's in the lab. And I can tell you that in the dorsal lateral striatum, these mice can eat normally, they can locomote normally, they can learn the Morris water maze, they can learn novel object recognition, they can learn to press a lever to get food rewards. They can't learn that act of avoidance that I just showed you. I'm going to show you they're learning a new maze in just a second. So if you wanted to test people for their learning ability and their behavioral flexibility in learning, one might use what's called the Wisconsin card sorting test. This is a test that's often used for people with dementia, people with Parkinson's disease, for example. And the game goes like this. You have four cards or four symbols like this. And you draw a card, and in this case, the card has two, two red crosses. But you don't know what the rules are. Should you be matching two to two, red to red, or crosses to crosses? And so you, once you've learned one set of rules, then the rules change. 
And how long do you then, does it take you then to learn the new rule that, oh, now I'm supposed to match by color instead of by shape? So to do that experiment in mice, we can use that U to, that U-shaped uh, maze. The mice start here. And in the first case, you could have a response-based strategy. All you have to do in this maze is go up, hang a left, and you can find the platform. And the, the U maze has different colors. One color's white and one's black, but that's irrelevant. All you have to do is follow the rule, the response, turn left, and you'll win. Then the rule could change to Q-based. So instead of just turning left, now you've got to pay attention to the color. Is it white or is it black? And the, the platform may always be associated with the black side. So what you see here are strategy shift experiments with our mice. And these are mice that are rescued in the dorsal lateral striatum, just as I showed you, and another set with it rescued just in the ventral medial striatum. Here's the first acquisition of the from response base, just turn left, and you can see after three training days, they're all turning left 90% of the time. And they all learn this approximately the same rate. Then when you shift the strategy, now you have to follow the color, white versus black. Takes them a while, but again, they get up so they're about 90%. The dorsal lateral do pretty well, but the ventral medial have a little trouble doing this experiment during the strategy shift. You can also do a, a reversal learning. So you first learn you have to turn left, now you have to turn right. Or you first learn to go to the black side, now you've got to unlearn that and learn to go to the white side. Again, they all can acquire the task fine, and in this case, the reversal learning, all three groups of mice are equivalent. They learn this task, but I've written down here latency, and that's because these lesioned animals get to the choice point and sometimes they just hang out there and say, oh my God, I can't remember. Am I supposed to go to the black or the white? And after about 10 or 15 seconds, they finally make the right choice because you could see their performance is good, but they're just slow. They can't learn this two-way act of avoidance. Remember where they get the sound that tells them they're going to get a foot shock and they should move to the other side. A normal animal takes quite a few trials to learn this. They get pretty good at it. They, their avoidances are very high. The number of times that they avoid the shock. A dopamine deficient mouse would never figure that out, even if you gave it, but if you gave it L-dopa to restore dopamine, they do pretty well. So Jonathan Fadok, a graduate student in the lab, uses kind of a variation on this act of avoidance. It's called fear potentiated startle. And what he's done is to take mice and train them that a light will predict a little bit foot shock, very mild foot shock. So every time they see the light after they're trained, they should anticipate that they're going to get shocked. And so then when he tests them, he puts them in an apparatus that can measure their startle response. If you hear a loud noise, you'd probably jump, especially if you didn't expect it. And so you play a loud noise, they jump, and you can measure the amplitude of that startle. If they have been trained that a light predicts a foot shock, they're fearful and they startle even greater. And so fear potentiated startle is just the difference between the startle response when the light's shown and when it's not shown to the same sound. And these are experiments that a graduate student has been doing in the lab. And the only point I want to make is that dopamine deficient mice can't learn this fear potentiated startle at all. And in this case, it requires restoring dopamine to two brain regions in order to learn this behavior. You can see that if he injects here and here, one is the amygdala, one is the ventral striatum, then they have a normal uh, startle response it's shown here as long-term memory of this effect. Okay, so we're getting close to the last section. We are at the last section. And we're just gonna introduce one more player into this circuit. And that's an excitatory neuron that activates the dopamine neuron. 
Okay, so far we've just been thinking about dopamine as being released all the time. That's not true. Dopamine is released in response to excitatory input. And here's where the word salience is going to come in. So salience for a mouse that's hungry is finding something that's important, like a hunk of cheese. Okay, so this is a salient event for this mouse. It's very hungry, it's found this, this hunk of cheese. And the dopamine neurons respond to salient stimuli, the food, by what's called burst firing. There are lots of action potentials all grouped together. So there's a little burst, there's another smaller burst, and the rest of these are just random spikes of activity. A burst of activity gives rise to a burst of dopamine release in the striatum, and that turns out to be important. So these dopamine neurons, here's this excitatory input, it acts by stimulating one of those glutamate ion channels called the NMDA receptor. It's a type of glutamate receptor. And here's kind of what it looks like. It's a tetramer, and all the tetramers have one subunit, which we call NR1. So what, in this experiment, what we're going to do is take the NR1 gene selectively out of dopamine neurons. And we do that by expressing Cre recombinase from a gene that's only expressed in dopamine neurons and then cross it with a mouse that has these NR1 genes. These are the LOXP sites. And the recombination removes the DNA between the two LOXP sites, leaving a truncated gene that's non-functional. What happens is here's a, the spike train. This would be time of a normal mouse. You can see lots of clusters of spikes. The mouse that we've just made that can't receive the glutamate signals properly has very few of these bursts of dopamine neuron activity. These mice, compared to what I've been showing you so far, are remarkably normal. They can do all of these things, but they still are impaired in certain kinds of behaviors. And I'm gonna show you two of them. One is food condition place preference, and one is TMAs. Here's a TMAze, it's very simple. All you have to do, it's cue-based. I'm sorry, it's response-based. All you have to do is learn to turn left. There's food on both sides, but it's only available on top of a screen on one side. And you can see that the animals that don't have the NMDA receptor in their dopamine neurons eventually learn this task after 100 trials, but they're slow. Here's a cue-based, that was on my cover slide, they either have to go to the, learn to go to the vertical stripes or to the horizontal stripes. A normal mouse learns pretty well. These animals are slow to learn. So they're not paying attention to their environment. Here's this condition place preference. The animals in this case are going to be fed on the red side and not on the black blue side or whatever color that is. And one training, so you put the animal in there give it food, it eats the food, it's, it's in there for 30 minutes, next day you come in, which side of this apparatus do you like? A normal animal really likes the side where it was fed. An NR1 knockout mouse doesn't. So you do the try training again, put it in for another day, the normal mouse likes that side even better, the knockout mouse still doesn't like it. Maybe on the third day it's beginning to catch on Oh yeah, I guess the, the food was over here on the red side. The animal eats the food, but it's not paying attention to the color or the texture of the space where, it's, where it is in this cage. These are the medium spiny neurons again. This is another little cartoon. There's the glutamate input and the dopamine signaling. And there's one more piece of information I wanna give you, and that is the dopamine receptors come in two flavors. There's a D1 flavor and a D2 flavor. The D2 flavor is, has a very high affinity for dopamine, so it's occupied most of the time by just the basal tonic activity of dopamine neurons. The D1 receptor responds to the burst of activity of a dopamine neuron. And the D1 receptor, when it's activated, sets off a signaling cascade that leads to modification of Neuro, of ion channels, making them more 
uh, more active. It also leads to transcription and translation and stable changes in the synapse, strengthening the synapse, a process we call synaptic plasticity. And so when dopamine acts on the D1 receptor, this spine of a medium spiny neuron is actually strengthened and can, in a sense, remember the effect the next day. Without the dopamine being released as a burst, these D1 receptors are never activated, so this strengthening doesn't occur. So, just to finish up then, the old adages that you learned uh, in school is that survival, is it real or just a chemical reaction? I'm gonna change that to say success. Is it real or just a chemical reaction? And regardless of whether it's survival or success, depends on motivation. If you want to learn something, you have to be motivated. And it depends on paying attention to salient events in your environment. And dopamine is required for both of these processes, as I've tried to illustrate in my talk today. So a lot of people participated in these studies. The first group are students who actually did the work that I showed you. They've had a lot of support by other people in the lab. And these are former members of the lab. We have collaborations with a number of people that have provided mice or viruses over the years. The funding comes from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And of course, the mice uh, are the main players in this whole story. Thanks for your attention.